So let everyone. So I'm not going to make jokes, uh, and I'm not going to tell you how excited you are because deeply I know you are. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about acting like a no-no and challenging like a VC as product people. So why that? Matt has why this crazy French guy going to London to talk about this. But because last year, a wave struck us all with a very, very gross word at the center. So excuse my French. Actually, I'm French. I can do it. Profitability. Boo! Making money. My God, how gross that is. <laughs> and I started my career 20 years ago as a bootstrapping product entrepreneur. So I know when you invest money, that was my own money. So that changes things a little bit, you know. But I was struck at how many product people were actually scared by that. I don't wonder why and why in the past we were not having profitability. So I just asked questions, you know, I'm a product guy, so ask questions to people. And they say, yeah, stakeholders, always stakeholders. So how many of you think that we don't reach profitability because of stakeholders? Okay, you're, some of you are honest, that's good, okay. Uh, I heard plenty of stories about the English people, but actually some of you are honest. <laughs> Easy one, well, yeah, I know. <laughs> so I said, okay, let's imagine for a moment that the stakeholders are responsible for that. Okay, you know, we always have to get them to talk about problems and not solutions. Uh, not to have business plans or business cases. Well, thanks to one feature, we're going to sell billions. It actually, but what do we do against that? Well, actually, yeah, we talk about problems, not solutions. We tell them, yeah, you know, a roadmap is not really his plan, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes we even get them to read a book that I cannot quote because it's a competitor or products. God. <laughs> well, actually, it never works. Absolutely never works because it's product explaining. <laughs> Just like mansplaining, you know, but with product. So you have people in front of you that are interested by one thing when this will be out. That's it. So to get that, how to go in the right path, and actually, they don't need to understand, they need to leave it. They need to have something which is called skin in the game. So that's an English expression. So for the non-English speakers, the story is a chicken going to see the pig and saying, hey, let's have eggs and bacon. And of course, for the chicken, that's pretty easy, yeah. For the pig, it's a little more involvement, yeah? So in that story, we could say we are the pigs. That's the first time in your life you would be happy to call, be called a pig, actually. Yeah? <laughs> but are we, really? <laughs> yeah, so that's the awe moment of the presentation. <laughs> Let's do a big awe all together. Awe. I know. Good one. <laughs> but I don't think we are. And that's not me saying that. That's one of the best thinkers of the 21st century. Jean-Claude Van Damme. <laughs> because Jean-Claude, which is Belgian, not French, good, invented one thing called the double impact. I know, impressive. It was a real, I always suffer for Volvo, but uh, whatever. And actually, there's a law of the product organization that is called the double impact law. It's the fact that the product org exists for one reason, one reason only, reaching ROI for the company and the user. So not only the company, and not only the user. And the problem is that so many of us have one saying, we need to be user-centric. You can't, and you should not. 
Because at the end, no, the client is not a king, else our product will be Frankenstein creatures. So how do we get from that situation of having so many frameworks talking about user centricity and getting the business at the center of what we do? Not harming the user to get there, just finding the balance. And in a way, we are and we must be co-responsible of this economic success. So how? How to act like owners and investors? I'm not telling you that I have the perfect solution for that. Humbly, it worked at TripAdvisor. I hope it would work for you. Else just send me a message on LinkedIn saying it was crap, okay? Feel free, no problem, a lot of feedback. But actually following three principles. The first one is the investment principle. The second one is a capping principle. And the third one is the portfolio principle. And we'll get a bit deeper in every one of these. So the investment principle. Let's go back to what we do. Why were we invented? We were invented to shift technology from a center of cost to a center of profit. That's it. That's what we do. Else, products should not exist. So, if you take that and think about a product team, what is the job of a product team? Well, actually, you take time. One year, one million bucks. So, if you go back tomorrow and you say to a PM or to anyone in the product team, you know you've been given one million euros this year to invest. What is the ROI of that? That might make them think a little bit. If, like me, you are 21 teams, it's 21 million euros. So I'm responsible as a CPO of making sure that we're making money out of these 21 millions. And every product team needs to prove an ROI. So my responsibility as a CPO is just between the top line and the bottom line. Okay. The product teams are supposed to transform this, this time into no code, no features, not even impact, but into the right ROI on the right segments and with the right metrics that will actually allow us to reach our strategic destination. Now, once you say that, this is us, product people. How do we reach that? We cannot reach that alone. We need to transform our stakeholders from mere clients to co-investors. They need to put money on the table. They need to have the skin in the game. And the easiest way to do this is input. I insist on that. Pitches, not business cases. Because I've never seen a honest business case in my life. <laughs> Ever. That doesn't exist. So pitches, basic information that we can challenge. Second one, access to customers. Because having a request from a stakeholder and then being unable to connect with any user to actually test things is just impossible. So in a way, it's a quid pro quo. If you want things done, if you think that your ID can unlock the growth of a company, You'd give us access to customers, and that's part of the pitch, a list of people we can contact. And if we have to contact them with you, as a sales guy, customer success, whatever, no problem. Just put that in a pitch. Testing, because even if we like to talk to customers, a sales guy or sales girl will always be better than us to test a pitch because it's their job. Same thing to create a campaign when it comes to B2C. Well, the CRM team, they are good at sending good emails, or well, they should be, but that's another question. Then to go to market, progressive rollout, no problem. Let's discuss all together which are the first customers we want to test on. What you will do actually as customer success teams, sales teams, marketing teams to help us do this. Co-own things. And the most important one, 
co-responsibility of success and failure. There should not be a situation when the stakeholders just complain about the product teams because we didn't reach X or Y. They should be on stage with us. They should commit to the results, not the usage, this is our thing, but the business. How many new contracts for which segment and which amount within three months? And what will you do to make sure that we are reaching that target? So this is the first thing, getting back to being investors all together. The second part, which is deeply linked with investment, is the capping principle. How many of you have read or heard about ShapeUp? Okay. So this is not new. What I'm going to use are principles that were taken by the Basecamp team to actually build ShapeUp. I'm not telling you you should do ShapeUp. I'm just giving elements that you might find if you read the book. The first thing is appetite and ambition. Imagine that it's your own money. Okay, you want to invest it, you're a business angel. And well, you're very rich because you know you chose the right company and you have one million euros to invest. I can send you my uh, account number if you're in the situation, so I don't have them. And actually, you have just one million, not more, not less. You don't want to put one million euro on one startup. You will try to find a way, you know, say maybe 100 and see what happens. But capping exactly this, you pay because you want to see more. You want to see if really there was something behind that. So what is the ambition linked to this? How many weeks do you want to invest on that specific opportunity? Secondly, it applies to the activities that we do on a product team, both discovery and delivery. Because I guess all of you know the RISE score. All of you know it. Reach, impact, confidence, effort. Yeah. It was created by Intercom, and Intercom never used it. <laughs> I know. Just because it's the blog post that has the better reach, so the marketing teams chose to keep it, even if they knew that they were not using it themselves. Yeah, I've always loved marketing people. Um, sorry about that. So the idea with it is really to make sure that if you want to start with a confidence of 30%, you just take two weeks, not more, to get that level up. You will never have 100 persons, never exist, never will. We face uncertainty, uncertainty is everywhere. But you need to cap your investment, else you're gonna do design thinking for three months. So it's hard. It's hard asking your team to say just two weeks, not more than this. And then you get up with whatever you know. But these are the basic of investments. One more week means a week less for another investment. It means that you're gonna have an expense of 150, not 100. This will endanger your ROI at the end of the year. So this is not negotiable. And who's responsible for that? The trio. So I don't know how many of you use trios as a basic element of a product team, but I guess all of you know that, that Venn's diagram, you know, one that we use for product explaining actually. Well, actually, this is the product equation in plain sight. This is what a trio should do. I don't care who does what, to be honest. I ask my teams, my trios, to be able to answer anyone in the company or when and what. Not when this is going to be out, but when you're going to stop investing on product discovery on that one. When do you expect results? When will you know if you need to cap, to top up a little bit? Because you think that there's more to get afterwards. And this is the same thing from the lean engineer 
or the product designer or the product manager. Roughly three people making the investment decision of the team. Then the portfolio principle. We go through investments, we go through capping, none portfolio. Because as any investor, you don't put your eggs in the same basket. So let's take the example of a restaurant product, which I know, and these are fictional examples. I just use a stupid scale, ROI and risk. Okay. Let's imagine three kinds of investments. That you might relate to that because usually this is exactly what you do when you invest your own money. You have one type of it, which is low hanging fruit or enablers. Low risk, low reward. So that might be UX improvements or bug fixes. That could be an enabler for the marketing team. You know that this migration will not create money, but that's okay because you need it. That's just like putting money on your bank booklet, okay? Not a lot of interest to get, but still, you need to do it. Then you have the core of what we do, product initiatives. That should be 60% of what you do, minimum. Because this is how you build short-term and long-term returns. I say short-term and long-term because what we do usually have a direct impact on the business, but that, that should be on the long-term. Well, the low-hanging fruits usually could be really short-term. And the last one is the real bets. Plenty of people use bets when it comes to initiatives, and I absolutely hate it. Because the bet is by definition something that you put without, not, not without a lot of information, but with very limited knowledge of the impact it could have. And the thing that the biggest the startup is, the biggest the product company is, the less we do bets. When you are pre-product market fit, everything is a bet, actually. You don't know which are the results. But if you don't do bets as a big company, you will die. You will go on doing local optimum. So you need to make sure that you protect that bandwidth when it comes to bets. And maybe you will lose that money. Maybe. And that's okay. Because that's part of the game. Bets are here to change the future. So when you do low-hanging fruits, you do the presence. When you do product initiatives, you build for the near future. And when you do bets, well, you build the next future. This reputation is not universal. This was the one that we had on the B2C teams. And that might change just like any portfolio. Depending on market conditions, if you have a crisis in front of you, you need to change how you invest. That's pretty obvious. Second, the team on the tribe. Some teams on sub tribes in the organization might be more keen to take risks. Others, like platform teams, they're here for reliability and security. So no, they won't take a lot of bets, and that's perfectly okay. Company or product stage. Company stage, just like I told you, pre-product market fit, full bets. Same thing for a product, a new product, new brand product, maybe more bets. Same thing, that's absolutely okay. Your budget structure, how many of you actually own their own product budget? Meaning that it's not a brand or division that telling you should do that and I give you the money. Okay. When you're in a situation where you're kind of a studio, lab, or whatever, and that's the thing usually in big, big companies that are not really product-centric, you cannot invest your money. You're an advisor. You need to act like an investment advisor, saying this is the level of risk of your investment. These are the odds of failing. So we can go on with that. It's up to you. Okay? I did my job. Now the good thing is, as product people, we are so good at unrisking things. This is what we do, right? 
all the frameworks that we have are here to under risk. So he's saying, we have a plan, if you want, to lower the level of risk, to make sure that the odds of success are better. Still, is there a decision to take? And then the most important one, and I'm going to insist a lot on this one. You. Your own level of risk tolerance. You might read plenty of things in books, might listen to podcasts, might hear a crazy guy, crazy French guy on stage, but be self-aware. Because not all of us are made to create startups from scratch. And it might change with time. I'm 42. I know I look younger, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't have children, that it might be why. No, no. <laughs> but I don't want to create a startup. I've done that three times in my life. I know what is the cost. And that's okay. I'm old. That's it. <laughs> I know, yeah, that's hard for me to say that. But yeah. See, I love Legos, so that's okay. And that's the same thing in your teams. Don't push every product manager, product designer, product engineer to be in a situation when they have to do a lot of bets because some people are not self-aware enough. And if you push them, they might end up with a burnout. So be self-aware. Things change. You can prepare people, but there's no one way to do product. So if you actually respect that, you'd make your product teams and your stakeholders act like owners. Acting like an owner is really taking responsibility of the success and the use of your resources. And act like VCs, because you need to challenge, you need to understand what is the best way you can get out of your information, this opportunity versus that one. When we did that at TripAdvisor, we ended up with stakeholders Actually, not asking when will it be out, but okay, let's see what happens depending on the results of the past initiatives. And one thing, how can we help? That was so, it's almost so touching. <laughs> it changes. And in a way, with my stakeholders, I was not talking about roadmaps, but in a way, they were doing now, next, later by themselves without even using the words, because they understood that we had to face uncertainty, and even then couldn't predict the results. So it worked. They were doing products. So if you do that, you will actually reach the double impact. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do it. Thank you. <laughs>